All right, so let's get uh, started. This is uh, almost the end of the course, and this is the last week. This is the last class I'm taking. There's uh, another guest lecture uh, on Wednesday, and the guest speaker uh, is VC. He's going to talk about investments. Uh, he used to actually make a lot of investment in solar, and nowadays it's actually very hard to find VCs who made investment in solar back in 2008 to go and come and talk about them because you know most of them haven't gone uh, really well but uh, Shaheen I know him from before so you know, I was able to catch hold of him and he's going to talk a little bit about how these you know how those investments are made and uh, what are some of the new areas that people are looking to make uh, investments in. So. Today I want to wrap up the discussions uh, that, you know, the awesome discussion we were having about talking about all these crazy ideas and all these new ideas that people are thinking about uh, for making these high efficiency cells. Then I want to touch upon uh, a topic which is, you know, I have particular interest in, which is uh, BIPV, which is integrating photovoltaics while you are building the, while you are doing the construction of the building. So BIPV stands for Building Integrated uh, PV. That is especially when you're building these new buildings, how you can integrate these uh, solar cells and also energy saving elements uh, into these buildings. And then we'll talk about what's on your mind, that is uh, the upcoming uh, exam uh, on uh, Friday, okay? So we were talking about this uh, thermophotovoltaic system and it basically, you know, the way I like to think about it, it's basically creating a local sun. So you have, usually you have uh, one sun which is at, uh, you know, 6,000 uh, Kelvin. And what you do using this uh, thermophotovoltaic system is that you create this uh, local sun which is uh, at a temperature of uh, around uh, 2,500. And you can exchange energy with it, you know, you essentially put a spectral uh, filter over here and this only allows uh, photons which are uh, below a certain energy so it has a step uh, kind of a profile over here so it only allows photons which have energy which is close to the band gap of the cell you want to absorb in and rest of them you essentially reflect them back to this absorber and similarly the photons which are not absorbed by the cell do you also reflect them back uh, to this absorber and it absorbs them and uh, you know so it keeps on heating up because of uh, these, uh, both the light which is coming from the sun as well as these photons that you are, uh, uh, you are essentially reflecting back to this uh, absorber. So now my question to you is, you know, would, would, would this system, would this thermophotovoltaic system still work if I didn't have this, uh, didn't have this uh, spectral control over, uh, over this, uh, uh, over this uh, local sun. So, you know, what if I did not have this layer which was controlling the spectrum which is uh, incident uh, on my cell? Would it, would it, you know, would it still have this very high efficiency or no? How, how many people think it, it would have still have high efficiency? People who think it won't have high efficiency, well, why do you think? But my sun is, is a much cooler sun now. It's not at 6,000 Kelvin. It's at 2,500 Kelvin. Yeah, so the point is that having a cooler sun actually doesn't really help. And you can do an analysis on this, and maybe you know we'll ask this on the end term, is that if you, if, you, if you have a cooler sun or a hotter sun, as long as you have a spread in your spectrum, like this, you know, you have a black body radiation, you, if you, even if you cool it down, that would essentially, you know, make a spectrum like this. You can only absorb away, you know, you still, 
if you optimize the band gap for that cooler sun as well, you'll still only absorb that spectrum very inefficiently. So all that which is above the band gap, you will uh, thermalize it. All that which is below the band gap, you won't absorb it. So it doesn't matter if you have a cooler sun or a hotter sun, as long as you don't, uh, you don't uh, uh, um, process your spectrum using this uh, spectrally selective element, you still won't uh, get high, high efficiency. So this is very important. So now I had, a, you know, I had this breakthrough idea, you know, sleeping over the, uh, you know, occurred to me over the weekend, is that you know why not get rid of this absorber? Or you know why not? I mean, if having this cooler sun doesn't really matter, why don't you know I take this sun and uh, you know instead of do doing that radiative exchange with that local absorber, I would essentially you know have this radiative coupling with my hotter sun, right? The sun that uh, Mother Nature gave me. So what's wrong with that idea? Uh, you know why do I? If I remove the absorber and essentially you know, do this, again, put the spectrally selective element and reflect back everything back to the sun, which is uh, above the band gap of my silicon cell. And you know, sun will heat up a little more. And then when I, you know, whatever is not absorbed by the cell, again, I reflect it back to the sun. And you know, that will essentially uh, do the same thing, right? If I get rid of this, uh, a local sun and just have this coupling with my uh, with my bigger sun would that work this has JP So you're saying this, this spectral control would now be different that I require. The earlier I had tuned it to, to my to my cooler sun, but you know I can assume that I can you know make this step function move. I can make it move to a, a lower wavelength so that it corresponds to the peak of my peak of my solar spectrum coming from the from the actual sun. So as you might do that. Would it still work? Like, would the efficiency rise if I just put the spectrally selective element in front of my solar cell? That's a very valid argument. Does, does, do people agree, or somebody wants to add to it? You know, why not I? I mean, why can't I interact with the sun? Right? It's a black body. I'm a black body. I'm a black body at you know 90 degrees, whatever. My temperature. Sun is a black body at 6,000 Kelvin. But w what is required for this effective coupling between two two black bodies? is a hotter black body, of course it would have a different spectrum than a cooler black body. But to couple those two, essentially I, I require 
if I can confine the sun so that you know it emits all this light in this very narrow angle, which is just incident on my solar cell, then I can still have a very effective coupling with my sun. You know, I can emit back all the energy, and which I don't need back to the sun. And you know, I can say basically, I don't need these photons. Give me only the photons which are, uh, you know, near to the band gap of my cell. And I could do that if, if you know, I was the only person interacting with my sun. But I'm just, a, you know, a, a, a droplet in the bucket. There's, there's a whole lot of solid angle. It's a complete, uh, if I compare, you know, the angle that this solar cell is subtending on the cell, on, on the sun, it's very small, right? So that's why you need to create a, a local sun which you can couple very effectively with. So last time I showed you an example that you know basically you create this local sun and you surround it with this uh, with this uh, thermophotovoltaic cell or this cell which are made out of germanium or gallium uh, actinide. So that effective coupling between my um, uh, you know sun is again an important thing. So there are two important things. One is this uh, coupling. The other is this uh, spectral filtering. So these are two very important things required for a, a good uh, thermophotovoltaic uh, system, okay? So they try to use many layers. So if you're doing this in a lab, you can actually make pretty good uh, spectral filters. The more la layers you use, you'll make better and better uh, filters. And uh, would it be commercial or not? No, I mean, uh, typically not. But uh, in a lab, yes, you can make a good spectral filter. And you're talking about this system, right, where it's, it's reflecting back all the light uh, back to this uh, local sun that I've created, right? So this, this, this uh, if you use like eight, nine layers of these uh, uh, materials, you could make a pretty good, uh, almost uh, step function kind of topic. <coughs> okay. So, but thermophotovoltaics, if properly implemented, it can achieve efficiencies uh, very high. And here's my, you know, here's my, uh, uh, not really my, but kind of the DARPA and. Uh, Military uh, mission for the uh, you know their pipe dream for these kind of uh, thermophotovoltaic systems. So remember those soldiers which carry the batteries on top of their backs and you know they have to carry them across uh, the deserts. So if you think about the hydrocarbons, right? They have much higher uh, uh, energy density. And if I could you know somehow you create this micro thermophotovoltaic system, I can make a fuel cell over here which would create this. Uh, create this local sun at uh, 2500 Kelvin and then I'll place a solar cell around it and you know I could make this chip size kind of a module and it would give me essentially you know it, if I connect it to my it would be essentially the same size as the battery of my phone but it would power the phone for a for a month instead of uh, powering it for a day so again it's a field of uh, active research if you want to raise money from DARPA or, uh, or you know army uh, research office they love these kind of proposals okay <clears throat>